I would like to take a moment to thank you for a remarkably comprehensive and very, very informative talk. So one question is whether there might be any benefit from radiation for leptomeningeal carcinomatosis. Can you speak to whether there is any evidence to favor that? Well, thank you for asking that question. This is obviously an issue we did not address in the talk. So leptomeningeal carcinomatosis, just to bring everybody up to speed, is a very difficult and complex problem because here we have disease that actually lines the surface and the inner linings of the brain and can sometimes even extend down into the spinal cord. And so the extension of the disease is quite substantial. Quite a significant volume of tissue becomes involved. And this is disease that creeps along the lining, the PL lining, the membrane of the brain. It's a very difficult problem to treat. We can produce symptomatic improvement in patients with leptomeningeal disease from non small cell lung cancer with whole brain radiotherapy. We do not substantially prolong survival. We probably do not make much of a difference in the natural history of the disease other than helping with the symptoms. In particular, the symptoms that appear to be benefited most are deficits of the cranial nerves, the nerves that come out of the brain, because the nerves are at considerable risk of getting coated with this leptomeningeal disease and then not functioning well. So the leptomeningeal carcinomatosis problem results in what we call cranial neuropathies, and these cranial neuropathies can be helped by whole brain radiotherapy but it is clearly a palliative approach. Now, people have also tried systemic or chemotherapy options for this using a variety of different approaches, either using intrathecal drugs or intravenous drugs or even oral drugs. Most of these have not really shown huge improvement in the outcome of patients, and so this remains a vexing problem for which we don't have a good solution to date. Thank you. Can you speak to your general conclusions about whether at this point you think the data are strong enough to recommend prophylactic cranial irradiation for locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer after completion of chemo and radiation, perhaps with surgery, and how you would approach a patient who comes to you asking about this after they have completed treatment for their disease in the chest? Absolutely. So this is obviously a very crucial question. Let me start first by sharing with you what the party line is. So the data that I showed you from the RTOG trial were presented at the national meeting that radiation doctors go to. This meeting is known as the ASTRO meeting, and Dr. Movsas was the investigator who presented the data there. I happened to be the moderator at that meeting, so I got to editorialize his talk. So Dr. Movsas' conclusions were very clear. His conclusions were that whole brain radiotherapy decreases the likelihood of developing brain metastasis. It does not lengthen survival, and it is associated with a decline in the Hopkins verbal learning test, especially at early time points. And therefore, these data would be interpreted to mean that routine use of whole brain radiotherapy should not be considered in these patients. However, that does not preclude the possibility of selective use in individual patients. Now, selective use can take many forms. One can look at a specific patient and try and estimate whether that patient has a higher risk of developing brain metastasis. So, for example, if we look at a patient with squamous cell histology versus an adenocarcinoma histology, the patient with adenocarcinoma would more likely be at greater risk. There are emerging data that are not fully conclusive that show, for example, that patients that have greater bulk of disease, if there's significantly more stage 3A or 3B disease compared to somebody else with less voluminous disease, that patients with more voluminous disease might be at greater risk of developing brain metastasis. An intriguing set of data that are emerging now are beginning to show that if we look at the PET scans that patients have at the time of diagnosis, if the PET scan is very, very hot in the primary tumor, then that patient might be at a greater risk of subsequent development of brain metastasis. So in a given patient, if we can take these different parameters and put them together and come up with a gestalt that a particular patient might be at a higher risk, and if that patient is also concerned about the risk of developing brain metastasis, then thinking about whole brain radiotherapy for that patient might be reasonable. 
In my practice, I have faced the situation on more than one occasion, and what we have done is had a very frank discussion with patients about both the risks and benefits of whole brain radiotherapy. And we have attempted to use this technique of hippocampal sparing whole brain radiotherapy, where we try and spare the region of the brain where we think the stem cells reside that might be instrumental in forming memories and try to avoid that region when we do the whole brain radiotherapy. We do not have conclusive data that this is necessarily a good thing to do or that it categorically spares memory, but this is what we've done in some patients. We've done the prophylactic cranial radiation if we agree that this is a high-risk situation, that the patient recognizes that this is a treatment that can be offered with the potential for some cognitive loss, and that we try and attempt our level best to minimize that loss. So it's a lengthy answer, but it's a highly individualized answer depending on the patient's status. Fair enough. A practical question comes in, and that is, is there any practical difference between prophylactic cranial irradiation and whole brain radiation therapy, except whether you are treating the potential for brain metastases or visible brain metastases, or is it the exact same procedure for both? It's very, very similar. There are slight differences. So the technique is identical. You're treating essentially the same volume. You're fractionating the radiations so you're treating on a daily basis. What's different is the actual dose. So when a patient has obvious metastasis in the brain, we tend to use a slightly higher dose of radiation compared to when we are using this in the preventive or the prophylactic setting when the biologically equivalent dose is a little bit lower. So we tend to use a little less dose each day because we also know that one way to cause cognitive decline in the brain is to use a lot of dose in a very short period of time. So if we pack in a high dose in a short period of time, the brain is more likely to suffer memory defects and other cognitive decline. So that's the difference between the two. Are you less inclined to recommend whole brain radiation in an immediate way for patients who have smaller and asymptomatic brain metastases or if there is someone who has even sub-centimeter several lesions, you're inclined to treat them sooner rather than later? So the answer to that question is, is a lukewarm yes. And let me tell you why it's a lukewarm yes. Intuitively, if a patient comes in with asymptomatic disease, they have no symptoms, and the scan shows that the disease is small, it's not very large, and that this patient also has disease elsewhere, and there is a need to get going with chemotherapy quickly to control the disease elsewhere, then we might say, your disease is asymptomatic, it's kind of small, you know, let's just go ahead and start the chemotherapy, we'll wait on the whole brain radiation, and we'll repeat the scan in a month and see what's going on. And sometimes you can get away with this. There are some patients where the chemotherapy works on the systemic disease, sometimes even on the brain disease. But the brain disease might be slow and it might remain stable and you can continue the systemic therapy and the patient benefits from this approach. However, in all honesty, this has never been studied in a clinical trial. And for every patient where I've seen where I'm encouraged that this was a good thing to do, I've seen more patients where I've been discouraged in the sense that a month or two later, there's more disease in the brain, and it's almost like, oops, okay, now we have to interrupt the chemotherapy because the disease is growing in the brain. We're not going to be able to get away with this for too long. Let's go ahead and do the radiation to the brain. So really, we don't have a good handle on who are the best patients in which this approach can be used where we delay the whole brain radiotherapy so that the systemic therapy gets a chance to come in quickly. I think it's a great idea. We just need to figure out who are the patients that really benefit from it? A couple of questions about people who have a progression of metastases after whole brain radiation, and that is if someone has a single or a few lesions, do you routinely recommend stereotactic radiosurgery after whole brain radiation? And what can you say about the feasibility of repeating whole brain radiation in people who have multiple brain metastases? Or would you recommend not doing that and trying to manage this with systemic therapy or any other approach you might think of? So let's first start by defining which patients are most likely to benefit from radiosurgery. So we know that patients with a single brain metastasis benefit from improved local control in terms of lengthening their survival. So whether we improve the local control by removing the tumor surgically or treating it with radiosurgery, 
these patients actually live longer by getting more aggressive with their single brain metastasis. So most patients with one brain metastasis should be considered for radio surgery or surgery. Now, when we go to more than one brain metastasis, things change a little bit. We have not shown a survival benefit in patients with two or three or four or more brain metastases with more aggressive therapies, such as radiosurgery or surgery. However, we have shown an improvement in local control in randomized trials for patients with up to four brain metastases when radiosurgery is added. So in practice, it's not uncommon to use a number of around four as a practical number to consider as a cutoff point for radiosurgery. Now, this number shifts based on the center and the area of the country. In some places, they say, well, it works for four, five is pretty close, we'll use five. And as most of you know, radiosurgery is often done by applying a frame to a patient's head on the day of the procedure, which is a minimally invasive procedure, and then an MRI scan is repeated. And you might have obtained an MRI scan a week or two before that showed you four lesions, and you say, well, I'm going to do radiosurgery for four, but on the day of the treatment, you repeat the scan and you see six. Now you have a bit of a dilemma. What do I do? Do I treat four, call it a day? Do I take the frame off, not do the radio surgery, Or do I treat all six? And depending on your approach and your beliefs in the value of radio surgery, some people do it and some people don't. That's why I showed you the example of the paper where they were treating patients with up to 10 brain metastases, 4 to 10 brain metastases. This is not a randomized trial. This is just the experience of a single institution. And they go on to contend that they get better control rates in the brain by doing radio surgery. But we have nothing to compare with. So it's hard to know if the data are real or simply a function of selection bias. So that, I hope, helps define the role of radio surgery. The next question was, do we actually add radio surgery to whole brain radiotherapy or do we actually add whole brain radiotherapy to radio surgery? These are two different things. And my bias is to add radiosurgery to whole brain radiotherapy because that's how all the studies have been done. That's where we have the evidence. However, I must state that there is quite a voluminous practice out there of patients who get radiosurgery and whole brain radiotherapy is withheld. And the intention here is that we'll come back and do a scan in a couple of months, and if we do a scan in a couple of months and if we see more disease, we'll treat that with radiosurgery. And then we'll come back again in a couple of months and we'll do a scan if we see more disease, we'll come back and treat that with radiosurgery. Now, you could argue that that's fine, and it might be fine to do that, but we don't really have any good evidence to support it. It's definitely much more expensive to do it that way. And the concern is that we're now allowing the disease to actually recur. And we know from lots of data that recurrent disease in the brain is a bad idea. People do worse cognitively. So are these patients actually doing worse because we allow the disease to come back? And that's actually never been studied. So because of all of these ifs and buts, my personal bias is to recommend the addition of aggressive local therapies on top of whole brain radiotherapy for most patients. Now, even in my practice, I have patients that don't get whole brain radiotherapy because they have major concerns and reservations. They'll say, I've heard everything you told me. I'm still concerned about the cognitive deficit. I'm not going to do the whole brain radiotherapy. And that's okay. We obviously want the patient to be able to make an informed choice. Jack, I don't know if there was another aspect of the question that I missed. It was really what happens if someone has multiple additional metastases after having previously received whole brain radiation months or a year before? Very, very difficult situation. So there are only a handful of retrospective reports in the literature a bunch of patients were treated and somebody went back and looked and said, okay, this is what happened. This is not a clinical trial. And these reports show really very, very limited to no gain from retreatment with radiation to the brain. Having said that, it is not uncommon to retreat patients with whole brain radiotherapy in selected situations. So let me give you some examples. If a patient was treated with whole brain radiotherapy quite a while ago, many, many months ago, a year or two ago, and now they have metastases that pop up in the brain. And during that time, you have seen that the metastases that the patient originally had had shrunk or disappeared. And then what you're seeing now are new ones that are popping up. And it's reasonable to conclude that this is a patient 
that had radio-responsive disease that went away, the patient benefited, they lived long, and now they have a second occurrence, and there's a possibility they may respond again. So that kind of a patient would be possibly a good patient to retreat with whole brain radiation. You have to be careful because the risk of damaging the brain goes up when you use it a second time. So you have to be ginger with the dose of radiation. And we haven't quite defined what the appropriate parameters are, but most people cut down the dose by 20% or 25% in terms of the second time around. Thank you. A question about whether there might be interventions that can decrease the risk of longer-term problems, radionecrosis in the brain, for instance, and whether an intervention like hyperbaric oxygen or Avastin, bevacizumab, might be beneficial. Do you have any sense or are there any data to speak to a potential benefit for these in terms of improving the safety of the intervention? So radiation necrosis is a challenging and difficult problem and is more frequently associated with options that give large doses of radiation to the brain, such as radio surgery. It is almost, almost unheard of with standard whole brain radiotherapy. Not zero, but single digit, 1% or less. With stereotactic radiosurgery, the number is larger. By imaging studies, it could be anywhere from 10 to 30%, depending on the parameters that you use to define radiation necrosis. But clinically symptomatic radiation necrosis, where patients have symptoms, is typically less than 10%. So this is a situation where normal brain tissue surrounding the tumor starts dying off, sets up an inflammatory response in the brain that is attempted to control with steroids at first, and it may work for a period of time. But in some patients, the inflammatory response takes over and causes lots and lots of problems and symptoms and can't be controlled with steroids. The gold standard for these patients has been resection. Go in and remove the necrotic tissue, and for the most part, that helps the majority of patients. And it also helps provide a diagnosis. Are we dealing with progressive disease or are we dealing with radiation necrosis? People have tried many drugs to try and reverse radiation necrosis, prevent it, get rid of it, and the results are mixed but generally discouraging. Most of the drugs have not really shown good results, and a variety of different drugs have been used, including hyperbaric oxygen, which really hasn't shown much benefit in radiation necrosis in the brain, although it has shown benefit in terms of radiation necrosis of the jawbone or ulceration of the lining of the mouth when patients get radiation to the head and neck region. Most recently, the use of bevacizumab has cast some interesting questions about the use of the drug for reversing radiation necrosis. The study that was done was conducted at MD Anderson Hospital in Houston, and they took a group of patients who had developed radiation necrosis because they had radiation to the skull-based area. None of these patients had brain tumors. All of these patients, in fact, had skull-based tumors, so we knew that the brain was not the organ at risk in terms of disease coming back. So what we were seeing was clearly necrosis and not recurrence of disease. These patients were treated with bevacizumab, and in fact, it was a randomized trial, so some were treated with bevacizumab, some were treated with placebo, and a group of patients responded. The ones that did not respond, they went back and checked what they were receiving and they were all receiving the placebo. And they were switched over to receive the bevacizumab, and they responded at that time. So necrosis of the brain in the absence of actual tumor in the brain has been shown to respond nicely to avastin or bevacizumab. However, we don't have a similar trial that's been done for tumors that are in the brain, either primary tumors or metastasis. But based on this trial, there is increasing use of bevacizumab in the face of radiation necrosis. And there are clearly reports, individual reports, of patients responding. So I think this is clearly an area that needs further study, but could be promising. Great. Thanks. Another question is, if you do have a patient who experiences a significant neurologic decline after radiation to the brain, are there any specific recommendations that you have or that you know of that could be effective in reducing that or reversing it? So once again, we are now dealing in the realm of limited evidence for this particular situation. And we sort of have to extrapolate from experiences in other diseases of the brain. For example, there was a European trial in patients with low-grade glioma. 
In this trial, patients were randomly assigned to what's called cognitive rehabilitation versus just observation after the treatment. So a deliberate attempt was made to try and help patients keep their memory intact. And the cognitive rehabilitation group did much better. So trying to work on preventing this could be beneficial. How does one prevent it? What are the things that you can do? There are actually simple tricks that one could try. For example, keeping the mind alert and active by forcing it to do tasks that require association between words and letters. Sudoku, crossword puzzles, repeating words, mnemonics, looking at calendars, repeating events, things of that sort. Even substantial reading could potentially be beneficial. So cognitive rehab could have a role, although this has never really been studied. For patients that have already developed cognitive decline, sometimes steroids will reverse some of the symptoms. And the reason for this is they have swelling in the brain. And steroids might be able to reverse it, at least temporarily. In other patients, there could be other situations that are contributing to this. For example, some patients have on medications, the most notorious being phenytoin or dilantin. This, in fact, is a drug that can cause significant cognitive decline. And sometimes patients don't actually need it. They've been on it for a while, and we tend to forget that they're on this drug. Taking away the drug can often result in significant improvement in the memory. So looking at the patient as a whole can help. We've found that many of these patients are often hypothyroid. But if you check their thyroid function, they're hypothyroid. And if you replace synthroid or thyroid hormone, their memory improves. When you've done all of this, when you rule out other causes, you check all of these things, and you're still left with a patient that has cognitive decline, are there drugs that work? Once again, the clinical trials are not very good in this regard. The RTOG trial is one of the best ones that has looked at the drug Memantin, the Alzheimer's drug. We don't have the results yet. But in my practice, we have used Memantin on some of these patients, and it appears to have worked in some patients. But that is really what we would call anecdotal experience, and anecdotal experience is only so valuable, it's clearly not categorically good evidence. There are other drugs in early testing that appear to do the same thing. Drugs called ACE inhibitors, for example. ACE inhibitors are used in the management of high blood pressure. And there are animal models and preclinical data that show that ACE inhibitors might, in fact, prevent the development of cognitive deficits. So there are clinical trials being developed for that. There are other drugs beyond that that are also being tested. So a series of drugs are being looked at for potentially reversing the cognitive decline but well, we don't have conclusive data on any of these yet. Do you think at this point brain MRIs should be part of standard follow-up for patients who are longer-term survivors of either non-small cell or small cell lung cancer, whether it is patients who are years out from surgery or treatment for locally advanced disease, or for patients who are receiving ongoing treatment but for a period of months or years after their initial diagnosis for advanced disease. We don't usually do this, but do you recommend surveillance of the brain? So the honest answer to the question is I don't know. And I don't know because we haven't done this in a structured, constructive way from which we can actually learn and see if this makes a difference. Now, this has been done in some other diseases. For example, there are small studies in the arena of breast cancer. And in the small studies that are available in the breast cancer literature, it does not appear that detecting brain metastasis early through screening MR studies results in prolongation of survival. So we don't improve survival by doing surveillance MR imaging studies in the small studies that are available in the world of breast cancer. In the world of lung cancer, we just don't have good data at all. I think it's less likely that we will see a survival improvement unless we pick up a significant cohort of patients with just one brain metastasis. If we were to be so lucky, then we might, in fact, see a difference in survival by doing surveillance. The problem with surveillance is when, how often, and for whom. It's a tough question. We don't know whether it should be every two months, every three months, every four, every six. Should it change in the second year compared to the first? Should it change in the third compared to the second? I think these are very difficult questions. But what I think is very clear to me from clinical practice 
is if a patient has symptomatic change, even the vaguest of symptoms, you know, persistent headaches that don't go away, memory changes, gait changes, vision changes, balance problems, you know, they're just not being themselves, it's definitely worth doing an MRI then because you might quite often pick up brain metastasis. So I don't know whether we should do surveillance. My gut feeling is that there might be a subset of patients that we could consider high risk, and if one were to do it, you couldn't be faulted for it, but there are no good guidelines. There's clearly potential to overuse and abuse it. Fair enough. Then still far more questions than answers with that. And then a final question is, what is your level of comfort and your recommendations in terms of administering whole brain radiation concurrently with chemotherapy or an EGFR inhibitor? Are you comfortable with that or do you prefer to avoid that if possible? It really depends on the drug. In general, if we don't know whether we're going to increase toxicity or not, we should avoid it. Because one of the biggest fears that patients have from whole brain radiotherapy is the possibility of cognitive decline. And if we don't know whether a drug could potentially increase that in combination with radiation, we should try and avoid that. So what do we know? What are the drugs that we know we can safely give with whole brain radiotherapy? Well, there are some clinical trials where some drugs have been used. So, for example, the alkylating agent timozolomide has been used in an RTOG study that has not yet been published. We don't have the results analyzed yet, where patients were treated with whole brain radiation and timozolomide for non-small cell lung cancer brain metastasis. We did not see any dramatic increase in obvious negative effects, so it's reasonable to conclude that this could be safe. Similarly, we have also looked at EGFR inhibitors. Now, this is an interesting area. EGFR inhibitors in the laboratory, most of them can be shown to be radiation sensitizers for tumor cells. So here, we could have the potential not only for an EGFR inhibitor to act on its own against an appropriate tumor that has the right characteristics for response from an EGFR inhibitor, but also the potential that it could enhance the effect of radiation on the tumor. So the same RTOG study that I mentioned to you with timozolomide had a second R where an oral EGFR inhibitor was combined, Tarceva, and that was combined with whole brain radiation. And that particular study, again, we don't know the results yet, did not show increased toxicity when Tarceva was combined with whole brain radiation. The problem is not drugs such as timozolomide or Tarceva. The problem really is the chemotherapy that we use for most patients with metastatic non small cell lung cancer. For example, if we were to use a gemcitabine-based regimen or a pemetrexid-based regimen or potentially even a paclitaxel-based regimen, there could be some concerns because these drugs are radiosensitizers and potentially also radiosensitizers of normal tissue. And that's where the worry and the fear comes from when we use the combinations of full-dose chemotherapy, especially used in a doublet context, where we might perhaps find more risk. There, I try and avoid it. Great. Dr. Mehta, thank you so much for your generosity with your time and the great answers you provided. And let me say also I'd like to thank the Longevity Foundation, which worked in partnership with GRACE, the Global Resource for Advancing Cancer Education, to have this program. Take care. And thank you, everybody. It was a pleasure.